My talk this evening is going to really focus on uh, business, but I'm going to start and end with a question about art history. Uh, the question is, what does a food fight among art historians about late Renaissance painting have to do with the disruptive changes in the nature of technological innovation? That's, that's the question we're going to answer. And to start, I want to sort of go back to about the year 1400. Um, this is a painting from that period, and as you'll see, uh, throughout really most of the Middle Ages, this was kind of the nature of art. Uh, painting was very flat, it was uh, very one-dimensional, more symbolic really than, than anything else. And then something very strange happened about the year 1420. Uh, painting changed dramatically, all art changed dramatically. And what you started to see was uh, paintings becoming much more realistic. Uh, the, the, the scenes were more realistic, you had perspective, you had dimensionality, and this applied to still lifes, to landscapes, to portraits, and there were sort of these long period of successive big improvements in the realism of painting that lasted really up until the sort of the modernist period uh, in the 1800s with the Impressionists and people who, who went a different direction. And in fact, uh, this period starting in 1420 has been referred to by the artist uh, David Hockney, the contemporary artist David Hockney, as a period of photorealism. And I'll just show you a couple of examples of this. So that was 1400 I showed you before. This is Da Vinci, 1500. You can see quite a dramatic difference. This is Vermeer, uh, his, his painting The Music Lesson from about 1660. And remember this one because we're going to come back to that particular picture in a moment. And then even up until uh, the 1800s with Ang, the French portrait artist, you can see a tremendous amount of realism. Now, as I said a moment ago, uh, Hockney referred to this as photorealism, but that's a very odd thing to say because, of course, the camera wasn't actually invented until the 1800s. Or was it? Well, it turns out uh, Hockney has a theory. It was about 10 years ago, he wrote a book called Secret Knowledge, and he postulated that, in fact, uh, the, the master, starting around 1420, had invented a series of camera-like devices that they used to improve and, and create new ways of painting, new ways of drawing. And this has been an extremely controversial book. For the last 10 years, it's really divided uh, art historians in the art world uh, as to whether this is true. Of course, some people say, I know, how he, what, he's really, what he's really saying is they all cheated or somehow they were using technology uh, in a way that was, uh, that, you know, sort of takes away from our romantic view about the Renaissance and these painters in their, in their garrets uh, struggling away. But Hockney went through a lot of research and he said, you know, there was a, there was a major kind of event around this period of 1420 there was uh, a separate technological development which was the mania for telescopes. Uh, and also for spectacles. And this meant that as those technologies improved, there was kind of a marketplace of kind of off-the-shelf prisms and lenses uh, and mirrors that could be purchased relatively cheaply and put to other kinds of uses. And indeed, uh, Hockney argues that in fact what the Renaissance painters did was they, they took those technologies and they put them to use to improve their work uh, this is an example of a device called the Camera Obscura. It was originally d invented for astronomical observations. It's one way of, for example, looking at a solar eclipse uh, safely. But he said that what happened in the Renaissance was that painters and, and artists used this device and others like it to, in a sense, marry technology with art and to use that technology to improve it. So it kind of projects, as you'll see in the picture, it projects an image uh, of the, uh, what the scene is outside, upside down on the canvas, and then the painter can use that to trace, to get the, the perspective right, to get the colors right, uh, and so on. And that this really, he said, is what explains that dramatic revolutionary break in art between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, indeed, what defines the Renaissance uh, itself. Now, a man named Tim Jennison has been trying to prove Hockney's theory in a very unusual way. And, and uh, Jennison is a hardware, software engineer. He has no artistic training whatsoever. He decided that one way to prove this theory was to reconstruct Vermeer's camera obscura, the way, the way Hockney is, uh, imagined it was to do, and not only to reconstruct the device itself, but actually to reconstruct the scene of that painting I showed you, the music lesson. So he had a barn, and it actually, just the orientation of it was perfect, so that the light coming into the barn, you know, he did a lot of research, I was working on this for years. 
he determined that the lighting of his barn was pretty close to the lighting in Delft where Vermeer was painting. And so he reconstructed the entire scene of that painting. And then over the course of several years, working, as he says, a couple hours a day, he has been systematically using this camera obscura that he built to recreate the music lesson. Uh, this work will be the subject of a documentary that's coming out sometime next year uh, that's been produced by the uh, magicians Penn and Teller, so you'll get a, a much better sense of how this happened. But uh, again, this is a man who had no training in art whatsoever, had no experience as a painter, and after several years, this is what he came up with. Right? Now, remember, he is not copying the Vermeer painting. He didn't have a copy of the painting itself. He had what he imagined Vermeer was looking at and the device through which Vermeer was looking at it, and he recreated essentially the process. And so the picture itself does not exactly match the Vermeer picture, but the similarity and the quality is so extraordinary, I think it really goes a tremendously far way to prove that Hockney was right, that the old masters were in fact using these lenses, these cameras, these prisms as a way of uh, of improving their work and, and, and getting the kind of realism that we had around about that time. Now, this year, uh, two art academics, uh, Pablo Garcia and Golan Levin, decided they had another way they wanted to try and prove the Hockney theory. Uh, and this gets to the, the nature of, uh, of what we call Big Bang disruption. There was another device that came about in the 1800s called the camera lucida. It's a much more simple device, but it can be used indoors or outdoors without any special uh, boxes or any other kind of equipment around it. It's essentially just a prism on a stick, but if you attach it and look down through it, it gives the illusion of projecting onto the blank page the scene that you're actually looking at. So it's an excellent way for tracing uh, the, the scene you're looking at, even as I say, in daylight. The problem was that the camera lucida disappeared about a hundred years ago. Uh, at one time, everybody had them, they were very popular, but they disappeared. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that the two academics decided they would do is that they would recreate, they would, they would bring back the camera lucida, get as many people as they could to use it as a way of demonstrating just how technology and art worked together during the Renaissance and why, in fact, the, the theory is not so controversial, not so hostile uh, as, uh, as many believe it did. So, of course, what they did was they launched a Kickstarter project uh, in the summer and they, they said, look, we, we went out, uh, we sourced all off-the-shelf components, uh, the prisms, the gooseneck, the clamp, everything. They found the component parts and they found uh, sources uh, using the internet globally to find people who would manufacture it, who would distribute it for them, and they launched a Kickstarter project saying, uh, we just want to rebuild this thing. Now, if you know anything about business, you would imagine that this would be a complete failure. Right? Here's two academics, they have no business experience whatsoever, they're launching a project to make something, they don't know anything about manufacturing, they don't have any inventory, they don't have any parts, they don't have a distribution network, they have no funding whatsoever, and in fact they don't even want to make a profit. What they said was once this, this experiment was complete, all they were going to do was give away, they open sourced the specs, they, they open sourced you know, all the contacts that they had for it, and said once this is over, anyone who wants to make these commercially, great, go ahead and do it. And what happens next is what we call a Big Bang disruption. Uh, and it's the kind of new approach to innovation, new approach to product development that we saw in, in a research project my uh, colleagues at Accenture and I have been doing for the last two years. We've seen examples like this in about 30 different industry segments uh, over the last couple of years. So even though we're talking about art here in a moment, we'll shift and talk about business. All right, so you can guess what the result was. They were looking for about $15,000. Instead, they got about 15,000 backers. And instead of raising uh, $15,000, they raised almost half a million dollars. They added two more production runs, and then they finally said, enough. This was over the course of a few weeks. They said, we've now pre-sold 10,000 units, uh, $30 a piece, and uh, this is all we want to do. This is really all we're capable of doing after this it's going to have to be somebody who wants to do it commercially, and they've said they're going to name some companies that will do it commercially for them uh, starting next year. The odd thing about the product, which they call the Neo Lucida, is it is cons considerably better 
than the version of the camera lucida you could have bought in the 1800s. The parts are better, the, the flexible, all these other things, it's better. And yet, they were selling it for, you could get it for a donation of $30, which is dramatically cheaper than what you would have actually paid in the 1800s, in 1800s dollars, for an inferior version of the camera lucida. So this strikes us as something really odd and really scary. Again, we're talking about art here, but it has a much bigger impact going to business. And let's talk about that. So, so what does this mean? How, how does this affect anything? Well, those of you who know anything about, about technology diffusion, there's a long-standing theory. It's been going on for decades based on a seminal work by a man named Everett Rogers. And he said that, that the way new technologies uh, enter the market and go sort of through their, their paces is through a kind of this bell curve life cycle. And he said, you know, you can find more or less five distinct stages of market penetration, market diffusion for new technologies. You start with the innovators and early adopters, and then you get the mainstream markets, and then finally at the end you get the laggards. And Jeffrey Moore uh, famously used this model several years ago uh, in talking about how to market high technology products. And what he said was, you have to have a different marketing message, you have to have a different approach for each of these groups, and you have to know when it's time to switch between them. And in particular, he said, between the early adopters and the early majority is something called the chasm, because that's where most products uh, fail. And he said, you have to learn to change your marketing approach dramatically to what he said, cross the chasm. Well, the Neo Lucida example and uh, all the other examples that we saw in our research suggest that that bell curve is dead. And that in fact, because of changes in technology itself, it's been squashed, it's been stretched into something that has a much more weird and frankly frightening shape. Uh, and because of the way this shape looks, we refer to this new life cycle for technological diffusion as the shark fin. Uh, and we said, you know, there's no longer five distinct sections of market segments, there's now just two. There's trial users, the students and friends, for example, of the Neo Lucida folks who tried it out before they got it right, and then there's everybody else, right? So when they put their Kickstarter project up, it was being bought by fine artists, it was being bought by hobbyists, it was the whole market all at once. And in their case, in a couple of weeks, the whole thing was over, right? A very short, very dramatic up, and a very dramatic down. The shark fin, we believe, is the new model for technological innovation and particularly for disruptive new technologies. We divided it, we think, again, into these sort of four interesting stages. I'm going to talk mostly in the next couple of minutes about the singularity, this first stage. And obviously the terms we took here from the Big Bang Theory of the Universe uh, applied fairly loosely. But in the singularity, that's essentially this period of kind of wild experimentation. You've got new technologies, you don't know quite what to do with them, so you kind of throw them all together, and then suddenly one of them gets just the right combination of, of, of components, the right combination of business model, and it takes off. Right? So that's the Big Bang. And the, one of the reasons it takes off is that because of our kind of connected world, uh, consumers now through social media and other technologies talk to each other, and when something is good, when they like something, everybody knows about it right away. And so market adoption can be extremely dramatic. Also, uh, we, in fact, we refer to this as catastrophic success. And what happens is, of course, after you get the catastrophic success, well, you've got all your customers in the first few weeks or the first few months. Now, the tapering off, again, is much faster than it was in the old bell curve model. So you've got to deal with getting out of markets more quickly and as well as getting into them. You've got to scale up, you've got to scale down and not get caught with a lot of inventory, with a lot of, of uh, overhead and infrastructure that you don't need. And then finally at the end, in sort of the phase we call entropy, there are some laggards who got sort of stuck and left behind. And for them, they have to deal with the fact that their assets, what were very useful to them in the early stages, have now become liabilities. And they've got to sort of find their way out of that stage and into some other singularity of some new market before they otherwise go out of business. Now what's driving all of this, as you could probably have guessed, uh, is in fact uh, mostly information technology and other technologies that exhibit what we call exponential behavior. 
So this is the curve of Moore's law. It should be familiar to almost everybody by now. Of course, Gordon Moore, founder of Intel, said every 12 to 18 months, computer processing power was going to double, price was going to hold constant. That's been sort of more or less the rule since the 60s. Other technologies, memory, processing power, uh, bandwidth, uh, have kind of followed a similar model. And that means that every 12 to 18 months, anything with a computer in it, or anything that uses a computer, which these days is pretty much everything, is going to get faster and cheaper at the same time. And it's going to continue doing that in sort of these weird ways. That's really the main driver of what we're seeing. It completely baffles the conventional wisdom. If you went to business school, bad news, forget about it. If you didn't go to business school, good news, you don't have anything to give up. <laughs> Everything you were taught has now become, in fact, counterproductive. Right? If you were told, for example, in strategy, you should only pick one strategy at a time. You either want to be the, the least cost or the highest value or something customized to a particular segment, but never more than one. That's not true. Obviously, again, the neo Lucida, right? They, uh, they are better and cheaper and more customized all at the same time right from the beginning. Marketing, as I already mentioned, you now market to everybody at once and assume that mostly the customers are going to market themselves. And finally, if you're familiar with the work of Clayton Christensen in The Innovator's Dilemma, who said, when a new technology enters the market, it usually comes in as inferior and cheaper, so you've got plenty of time to kind of work with it and learn what it's going to do before it works its way up into your customers. Now it comes in better and cheaper. You don't have time anymore to, uh, to uh, wait. These three main characteristics of the Big Bang disruption are pretty clear. Uh, unencumbered development, we said you know all the uh, experimentation that we saw. The undisciplined strategy, you follow all three at once, better, cheaper, and more customized. And then this unconstrained growth where the market pulls itself. I'll give you just a concrete example here. Uh, this is uh, the comparison of a standalone GPS device and then Google navigation or other navigation apps on the smartphone. Right, so the navigation people, well, they had this nice business, $100, $300 for the standalone device. Of course, they themselves had disrupted the uh, market for uh, printed maps or paper maps. They put Rand McNally and others out of business. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Google says, oh, we're just going to give away the navigation app. It's on the smartphone. It's on the network. Everybody already had it. And within a couple of weeks and months, millions of these were downloaded. And they put the DPS people completely out of business, or, or almost out of business. In a matter of a couple of months, suddenly stock prices dropped, sales dropped. Every measure you want for companies like TomTom Tom and Garmin and Magellan went through the tank. And they had almost no warning of it. Again, if they were following Clayton Christensen, it was going to be too late for them to do anything. Uh, and indeed, that's what happened. They're sort of straggling now to survive. These rules for the singularity, well, we've seen them already in the Neo Lucida example. Let's go back and take a look at it. They looked for what we call truth tellers, someone who sees that there's ready to be a paradigm shift. In their case, it was David Hockney saying, you know, I think, I think we're missing something big about art here. You want to make sure that you enter the market at just the right time when you've got the right component parts, reusable hardware, reusable software is best, and when you've got the right business model, in their case, you know, giving it away nearly for free. And then finally, that you want to make sure you have uh, your product in an experimental stage so that when it takes off, it can go. Now, it's really no surprise that this happened in the market of art because, as we've seen, that's a market where for the last 500 years, as it turns out, these secret technologies have been disrupting the way in which artists work for a long period of time. Now, of course, people like the creators of the Neo Lucida have the technology using the cloud, using the internet, using cheap components, using reusable hardware and software to prove this theory out in a new model we call Big Bang Disruption. And because these technologies are so ubiquitous, this is a model that anybody can use, including you. Thank you. <laughs>